hear you fine. We're all set. This is fantastic. Uh, so we're shifting gears entirely. We've got some, some really cool ocean stuff, and now we are going to explore some awesome maps. I also want to do a shout out on our speakers list. You are the only person with an animal on your face for our presentation, so we <laughs> really appreciate that. <laughs> and yeah, as this presentation coming up shows, uh, we are going to talk about amazing maps for nature conservation. Um, you can also check out Thomas Darns at, at bio underscore carta, so I encourage you to do that check that out but let's dive in with this presentation Thomas and uh, take us away. Thanks so much it's a real pleasure to be here today and I'm just going to share with you um, a, a passion of mine which is uh, maps and spatial analysis so I've been uh, in conservation for a few years now for about six years working as a spatial analyst in various roles and um, what I'd really like to do is, I'm actually not gonna show so much of my own work, but just show uh, some of the best examples of nature conservation maps in the world that are being used by conservationists uh, on the ground for informing policy. And it'll just be a, a really nice kind of showcase of some beautiful maps really. Um, by the way, the BioCarta hashtag, that's kind of meant to be uh, bio, meaning living, Carter meaning maps. So that's what I'm all about is maps of living things. So without further ado, let's kind of delve in. Um, one of the things that really inspired me uh, to get into this field was reading about Alexander von Humboldt. And if you haven't heard of him, you should definitely go and do some reading up because Alexander von Humboldt kind of started this whole idea, this whole concept of mapping out where different plants and animals live. And so this is his Natugamald, which is uh, one of his most famous uh, maps. So he was in the 19th century, he was traveling around South America. And it's what you've got here is like a cross section of the Andes in South America. And all of the small writing on the on that on that kind of uh, beautiful image is the names of all of the different species which he encountered at different uh, in different places across this mountain range and then on the side uh, of the of the map you've got all of this incredibly meticulous uh, detail um, um, describing environmental variables like uh, elevation and uh, air humidity and temperature and aspect and so he was really interested in understanding where different plants and animals live, why different plants and animals occur in different places where they do, and how the environment around them drives their distribution. So he was really one of the first people to, to start thinking this way. And he influenced a lot of people who came after him, um, but from a conservation perspective, one of the, um, one of the, the key uh, influences he had was on somebody called John Muir, who was a Scottish American naturalist who, it, it was kind of through him really that we, we started to see the first national parks being designated in, uh, in the United States, for example. And I, I kind of think a legacy of that is that we now have um, his onto our next map, map number two. This is the map of protected areas from um, the World Database of Protected Areas. Uh, and so what we see is all of the world's terrestrial protected areas in green and marine protected areas in blue. And um, you can delve into a lot more detail in this map if you uh, go and visit the Protected Planet website and they've got dashboards with all kinds of infographics and metrics about how different countries are doing at designating protected areas. And um, there's a lot more detail to it as well about kind of how effective the management is inside a protected area and what the protected area is actually protecting. Um, but this is this is kind of the, the high level map of protected areas across the globe. And this kind of informing um, international targets to protect uh, the, the target for the end of 2020 is, is to protect 17% of land and 10% of, of seas. And there are more ambitious targets being talked about for the next 10 years as well. Um, so this is this is a really key map, the, the protected areas of the world. Another map which uh, we have access to today, which I think Alexander von Humboldt would have found absolutely amazing, is uh, maps of species observations. So this is kind of the, the main um, splash page map from GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And 
the, the GBIF project really is trying to bring together data sets on the uh, occurrence of different species of plants and animals all around the world. So it compiles thousands and thousands of data sets from uh, scientists, from research institutions, and also from citizen science projects as well. Um, if you have an app like um, iNaturalist or Seek or iRecord, or any of these kind of apps, um, many of them contribute their data to GBIF where it can all be collated together. Um, and so what you see here is about 1.4 billion observations of different species uh, all around the world. And again, this is just a snapshot, but I highly recommend if you haven't uh, been before to go and visit the GBIF website and you can delve into uh, great levels of detail. You can go and explore um, a single species or what's been cited around where you live at different times of year. There's so much data there. One of the things you'll notice from this map is that um, the, there's some real densities of species observations in, in North America and in Europe. And that's not necessarily because those areas are more biodiverse, but it's because lots of people record the wildlife which lives there. So that leads to what we call a kind of um, a spatial observation bias. Um, and there are ways of kind of trying to work around that and map out where species actually occur overall. And so I'll talk about a little bit about that now um, with a few more maps as examples. So um, I work with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And one of the teams in my office is the Red List uh, unit. And this is just an example of one of their maps. So you've probably heard of the red list of threatened species. It attempts to um, quantify the extinction risk faced by uh, different species. And part of quantifying that extinction risk is mapping the range of the species. So this is a map for um, the uh, lion, for example, um, pretty familiar species. So Panthera leo, this is the lion. And what you see in the kind of, uh, purpley maroon area is, um, is his previous range um, uh, um, set against a historic baseline um, and in orange is the current range. So we're trying to remove the spatial recording bias and actually just map out where the species lives, um, where its total range is. And we've done that well for the red list, um, they've assessed around 160,000 species um, but when you consider that there are actually, we don't know how many species there are in the world, but there are millions of species at least, and we've only assessed 160,000. So it's just scratching the surface and um, some groups are better represented than others, like mammals and birds are relatively well represented. Um, a lot of invertebrates and definitely soil microbes, very underrepresented. But with this data, you build this up and if you can layer um, maps of species ranges on top of each other, you, you can stack them up and build a map like this. Uh, this is a really cool map that was also produced um, from the IUCN Red List uh, together with U uh, United Nations Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre, who also manage the protected planet. And so this is stacking up all of those different um, species ranges to map out species, what we call species richness or alpha diversity, which is essentially just the red areas are where the highest number of species occur globally. But if you're interested in species conservation, um, that's not necessarily the most useful kind of representation of, of species range data, because what you might actually be interested in are where are the threatened species, the, the species which are more likely to go extinct um, within the next you know, 20, 50, 100 years? And so this is taking just species which are threatened, so they're vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered species, and mapping out where those species occur. So you can see you can start to refine these areas down a bit, and this helps you kind of focus where your attention needs to be drawn to if you're, if you're interested in preventing uh, species extinctions. Um, and further to that, um, this map is then further corrected for range rarity. So it takes into account the range of a species. So the smaller a species range is, the more likely it is to go extinct, essentially. Um, and you can see because um, it's 
because a single extinction event um, is more likely to wipe out the entire species range because it only exists in a small area. So what you can see in this map is quite a lot of islands start to be drawn out. And so you can see in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, quite a lot of islands coming out in red there as well, and in the Caribbean, for example. Um, so going back to our um, big biodiversity species records uh, data set, um, I think this is something that um, back in the 1800s, Alexander von Humboldt would have found incredibly cool. Um, something else which I find incredibly cool is how we're now able to track individual species. So um, this map represents, it's lots of dots on a map representing just a tiny snapshot of this species being observed in this location at this time. Um, but what we've also got now is we've got um, tracking. So we're able to uh, be able to track in near real time the movement of individual animals. And one really, really cool example of this is this um, website. It's, um, this is from Internet of Elephants. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, definitely go in and have a look at Internet of Elephants. One of their projects is called Satellite Stories, and they worked with Olpajeta Conservancy in Kenya to actually track lots of individual animals living in this reserve. And so what you see in this image is you've got um, a herd of zebra and you've got a herd of gazelle and you can, during the, during the course of a week, you can hit play and you can watch all of these individual animals' movements track out and play out over the course of a week. So you can see herds of animals kind of going to drink at the watering hole or running away from that cheetah. And it's absolutely fascinating. And there's actually a, a whole series of little stories which you can click on in the side as well. And I'll take you through a nice little narrated story about, about what this um, herd or what this species has been up to that week. Absolutely fascinating uh, stuff. So I thought it'd definitely be worth mentioning uh, that one. Um, zooming right back out again to a sort of more global level, tracking data, um, uh, is being used also to monitor migratory species, for example, species which move around uh, a great deal more than these. Uh, so just one example of that is this uh, website, OSEARCH, and you can go and track, um, they have sharks, they have dolphins, they have uh, all kinds of animals in here, and you can go and follow individual animals. You can see when they were tracked, um, well, um, what species they are, um, how much they weighed, and you can you can actually follow them and see how far they've traveled in the past 24 hours or in the past month. And you can see here the shark going up and down the coastline of the United States and into the Gulf of Mexico there. Absolutely fascinating. There are lots of websites like this where you can go and track other migratory species. For example, um, in the UK, it's quite popular to track migratory birds which migrate between Europe and Africa, and you can track um, cuckoos and turtle doves and things like that. And the technology that's enabled this is, um, is usually relying on um, the fact that we have lots and lots of satellites now orbiting, orbiting the Earth, um, which enable us to open up technologies like GPS, uh, for example, which we all use in our phones uh, for, for things like Google Maps, for example. Uh, as well as understanding where species live and where they move, it's also important for us to understand where threats are to biodiversity. Um, and so keeping with the ocean theme, uh, this is a map of, uh, of fishing, um, of fishing effort globally. Um, so this uh, map actually relies on the fact that fishing vessels are required by law to transmit their, uh, their location at all times to the Coast Guard. And this, is, this map assimilates all of that data and it shows you in the, the kind of yellowish areas, that's where the most fishing occurs and it's hours of fishing per kilometer squared. Um, and what you can also see, one that's really, really cool in this map is you can see uh, you, can you see those kind of black circles, black kind of patchy yeah. circles in the middle of the ocean in some places? Those are marine protected areas or exclusive economic zones of island uh, states where there's, where, where there's big marine protected area in place preventing uh, fishing and protecting the, the, the marine diversity in that area. 
Um, so it looks from this map like some of those areas are working pretty well. But this kind of data can, can actually be used to track how effective those marine protected areas are and whether they are actually stopping uh, fishing activity from, from occurring there. Uh, moving on to another um, threat map. Uh, this is Global Dam Watch, which pulls together um, a variety of different data sources. But what you can see is lots of points on the map, and that's showing the locations of, of dams, um, usually hydropower dams. As it's coming from a few different databases. So you've got um, in the yellow and blue, you've got existing dams, and in red, you've got uh, dams which are under construction, and in orange, those are dams which are planned to be built. So you can see still lots more dams planned to be built in places like Brazil, in the Himalayas, um, and also in the Balkans as well, where there's a lot of um, freshwater diversity, a lot of migratory fish, um, whose migration routes can be severely impacted and disrupted by the construction of dams. So this is a really useful data set as well for us to, for us to use in our actual um, conservation planning work. Okay, one more global uh, threat map, which I kind of have to mention really, this is probably the most well-known one. This is Global Forest Watch. Uh, so what you see here is uh, the green areas are existing forests. Uh, the pink bits uh, represent forest loss. Uh, so this is um, places where forest has been uh, lost for various reasons, whether it's uh, uh, logging or forest fires. Um, and in fact, what you've got then is you've got these kind of yellow and orangey uh, kind of dots. And that's, uh, those are actually fire events. Um, so uh, so they, they represent where fires have occurred in forest. And you can actually, you can do all kinds of great, um, great things with this, with this technology. So you can say, say I'm interested in a particular protected area, I can set up an alert so that if, there, if a fire occurs within inside that protected forest, I can get an automatic email alert to tell me, hey, there's just been a fire going on here. And you can go and zoom in on the map and see exactly pinpoint where and when that fire took place. Uh, so this, um, both the, the deforestation and the fire alert is all based on uh, earth observation, remote sensing data. So again, it's relying on the fact that we have now all of these satellites going round and round the earth in orbit, taking images every single day. And um, that's allowing us to actually try and monitor habitat quality, habitat loss and degradation. And so just to kind of wrap up, really, I thought I'd take us back to uh, what's often considered to be one of the first or the first um, Earth observation, uh, which is this image, uh, Earthrise, taken by the astronaut William Anders on uh, an Apollo mission in 1968. And they were just going around the moon and they looked behind and hey, there's Earth behind them. And this is, um, there's actually one image before this that was in black and white, but everyone likes this one because it's in colour. So this is the first colour image looking back at Earth and um, it's sometimes called the most uh, influential environmental photograph ever taken because it, it just made everybody look back and go, wow, everything that we uh, depend on just exists in this one planet in the middle of the solar system, in the middle of the galaxy, and that's all we've got, so we need to take care of it. And so that's just a nice example of the first Earth observation. Um, so that kind of concludes my whistle stop tour of amazing maps. I had to cut out so many cool maps from this presentation, but you know, I, I hope you've uh, found a few leads to follow up on there. Yeah, Thomas, that was amazing. What I think we should do is is show some of those cool maps. We actually are pretty good for time. So if there's any, you know what? If there's a one map in particular that you missed out on showing in the presentation that you'd really like to show, go for it because that was an awesome tour and I, I'd love to see it. Okay, let's do it. Okay, here's another map. So this is a map from uh, the Nature Conservancy. And this is uh, actually using some pretty sophisticated uh, habitat suitability modeling. So what it's doing is it's looking at, uh, it's getting data on a bunch of different species and where we know they exist. And also what we know the habitat preference is for that species and the environmental preference. So what kind of temperature range they exist within. Um, we we'll call it an environmental envelope. And then it applies uh, a climate change scenario 
to these habitat maps. So it says, hey, okay, well, if we increase the global temperature by one degree or two degrees, what kind of shift can we expect to see in the, in the, in the range for all these whole bunch of species? And essentially what it's showing is where different species will move to under a climate change scenario. And what you see is, I think we've got mammals in pink, birds in blue, and amphibians in yellow. And they've done this for not just uh, North America, but for the whole of the Americas. Um, and you can see, yeah, un under future climate change uh, conditions, where these different species are going to need to migrate to. Um, and we're not talking about an annual migration here, but we're talking about long-term migration under climate change scenario. And, having information like this helps you kind of uh, plan where you're going to need to enable um, connectivity of protected areas and connectivity of habitat, for example, in order for these species to be able to move where they're going to need to, to get to. This is wild. Thomas, uh, uh, it's so nice to see someone who's uh, even more fond of maps than I am. And uh, I, I love that you got to bring up Alexander von Humboldt so much. Um, I'd encourage people at home to read The Invention of Nature, Andrea Wolf, which is like a book just, you know, absolutely uh, just defying him because it's a, it's a fantastic read. Uh, Thomas, for questions, if you wouldn't mind, I know the map's beautiful. If you wouldn't mind coming out of screen share so we could see you and uh, have a little oh, chat. Yeah, sure. That was. Uh, Awesome. Another quick note for everyone at home, you showcased a really cool map with some great titles for some uh, animal stories from Old Hedgeta Conservancy. Uh, yep. So while the BioFest is free for everyone, and again, over 90 countries have tuned in, we are using it as an opportunity to raise money for six incredible conservation organizations, one of which is Old Vegeta. Uh, they joined us yesterday for a really great virtual field trip with the last two Northern White Rhinos. So check that out and, and check out that map as well. Our first question for you, Thomas, is, is a question I have as well. Uh, where can we find all these maps? Like, I mean, you highlighted a lot of different sites. Is there anything that you've collected where we can see all of these maps together? Because the, the collectivity of them is really fantastic. That's a really great question. Um, I, I guess uh, I would mention a couple. So Global Forest Watch actually has um, quite a lot of great biodiversity data sets on it as well now. It's not just the forest change data set, but it's also got some of the key biodiversity data sets on species richness and endemism. So you can just go and turn those on and off and zoom in, in and out all day <laughs> if you want to. There's also, actually, there's a great resource uh, produced by uh, UNEP WCMC, the World Conservation Monitoring Center, who I mentioned earlier. And it's a, it's a collection or a collation of great map resources. Um, right. So what I can do actually is just after this, I will tweet a link to that so you can Perfect. And follow it. Thanks so much. Um, so that, you know, your work is, is pretty unique insofar as it can really help every other organization that we partner with. So every single story that we've told with good maps, with good data, you can help improve the outcomes for those conservation stories. How do you share this work that you do personally? And how do you share the work that these other organizations do with groups that can put it to use? How does that connection happen? That's, yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess uh, everyone loves maps, everyone uses maps. Um, I've just ended up in a specialization where I'm kind of cross-cutting all of the disciplines, all of the kind of conservation disciplines, and just, just using maps all the way through. Uh, and that's, that's put me in a bunch of different positions and a bunch of different roles. Um, one thing that we do have, uh, well, there, there's a Society for Conservation GIS, actually, which is a, a global kind of conservation GIS uh, uh, group. Uh, and they have their own website. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a group on wildlabs.net, which is the conservation technology uh, network, wildlabs.net, go and check that out. Um, in Cambridge, where I work, we actually have about 10 conservation NGOs and the zoology and geography and plant science departments of the university. And we have a GIS group within that where we kind of exchange ideas uh, and expertise. Awesome. People are going to have to rewatch this video. We'll put it up as an independent video just to hear all the amazing organizations you've highlighted. I mean, you have these in the top of your head and it's some really, really cool stuff, Thomas. Um, sure. So a lot of this data has been made possible by technology. And this, is, this presentation is an awesome example of technology being used for conservation purposes. Are more satellites going up? Like, are, are, we, are we sending up more, are we doing more to ensure that more data like this is going to be both uh, created, understandable, and accessible to the public in the coming years? Like, Absolutely. Cool. 
one of the one of the main challenges we have with Earth observation remote sensing at the moment is that actually the the rate of data acquisition, the rate that we're gathering new data, has has somewhat outpaced the rate at which we're able to collate and analyze it and make sense of it all. Uh, so there are some great initiatives at the moment to try and help with that, like uh, one is Google Earth Engine, for example, uh, and that was the, that, that's the platform actually that the Global Forest Change data set was, was based upon. Yeah. And so that takes the, um, the Landsat imagery, which is a, a, um, a USGS NASA Earth observation data set that goes back to the 1970s, uh, and it analyzes forest change from that. Uh, more recently, we've got uh, the European Space Agency Sentinel program, which has given us much higher um, spatial resolution. So we've got you know, 10 meters rather than 30 meters spatial resolution. So each pixel is now, rather than being 30 meters with Landsat, it's 10 meters with Sentinel. And it's also more frequent as well. So we've got new images every three or four days. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind, cloud cover can get in the way as well. Um, but you know some satellite programs now, like Planet, you have you know sub meter resolution imagery to the point where you're almost able to, in some cases, track individual animals without actually attaching a GPS tag to them, but actually just by by monitoring them from satellite as well. That is a lot. When you can read the newspaper over someone's shoulder, that's a sign that we've gotten some pretty cool tech. That's awesome. Um, yeah, technology is a tool, and it's up to us to to put it to good use. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas, you have drunk the Kool-Aid on maps, obviously, and so I'm curious if there's something that you had when you were a kid, like was there an original experience with map? Was it Humboldt? What inspired you to get into this so deeply? Actually, I think what it was, was um, I, I used to go and walk all around the, the hills outside my hometown, and I always used to take uh, a map with me because I, I love just piecing together the the puzzle, the pieces of if I walk up on that hill and look back down on my town, then I get this perspective. Or if I walk up on that hill, I get another perspective, kind of putting it all together within the landscape context. Um, and I, another thing is just, I always remember reading, you know, the, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I'd always have to have the map. I'd, at every page, I'd flick back to the map on the beginning, right? Because I always had to know, right, where are they now? Where's this? For me, that's always been uh, really important to, um, to getting uh, perspective, understanding context, understanding the world is understanding where things happen. Yeah. Do you just love to go up in like an airplane and just see the world from that perspective? Is it just? Oh, a... <laughs> yeah. I tried uh, Google Earth VR once and it absolutely blew my mind. It is. Fly around anywhere. Google has some really cool stuff. Let's face it. I mean, you've mentioned it twice now, but it's just so neat to see the world from 35,000 feet and uh, get a window seat every single time. Yeah. So uh, a, a sort of one last question before we wrap up in a minute. Uh, you, again, get to share this work that you do with so many different organizations and you've highlighted so much today. Is there a particular species or group that you are, are particularly fond of? And I know that this work can be used for so many great things, but is there something that really makes you tick that gets you excited? Um, well, I, I'm actually kind of a, a botanist by training, but I think I'm gonna have to go with uh, freshwater fish. Okay. Because, uh, as I say, my current job, and it's still quite a new job, um, hi boss, he's uh, <laughs> working on freshwater species and they're really underrepresented, you know. Um, freshwater systems are often neglected in conservation planning and in communications and thinking about biodiversity in general. Uh, and, and yet they're some of the most diverse systems uh, and they're also, you know, providing livelihoods for millions or billions of people as well. Yeah. So. So go and check out, actually last week there was a webathon on uh, for World Fish Migration Day. And if you go and search online, you can find a whole bunch of uh, great videos about that too. So uh, this is like a, a great way to say Thomas's boss should give you, a, you know, give him a raise. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Like fresh water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. And, and what amazing maps. Uh, I hope everyone gets a chance to check those out. And please do tweet about that. We'd love to share it out uh, so people can dive in more headlong. I mean, I could have spent an hour on each of those maps just trying to pierce it all out. So we really appreciate you uh, highlighting this really unique story as part of our BioFest today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure.